Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? This week we have a variety of things to cover. First is an older article on the CCP virus and brain damage. Then, scientists who are firing tardigrades out of weapons in order to see just how well they survive impact in space. Disturbing deep sea creatures washing up on the shores in America. The first pictures from the Chinese Mars rover. These and other news items can be found at timestamps given in the description below. Let's start with the first thing, and that's whether or not the CCP virus can affect the brain, and whether or not this is a long-term concern. We've previously described symptoms that occur from infection with the CCP virus. This includes anosmia, or your loss of smell. Different effects on the brain, particularly long-lasting brain fog, which is difficulties in thinking and remembering. These and other symptoms that are unusual have been a concern, particularly the link between the nose and the brain. Is it an issue with the nerves in the nose not linking to the brain, the virus getting into these nerves, or something else again that could carry on for a long time? Evidence has been mounting that there is a raft of other symptoms that are related to the CCP virus and some more extreme than just a loss of sense of smell. Symptoms can range from the aforementioned brain dysfunction all the way through to seizures and psychosis. Thankfully, the numbers of patients who are experiencing these extreme symptoms and as a consequence long-term harm are a very small fraction of those who have been infected and generally are represented by those who are most seriously infected and had the most severe symptoms. Thankfully, as the disease has progressed and people have begun to collect more samples from patients who have died, access to various tissues has increased. This includes brain tissue from CCP virus patients. Evidence would indicate that there is inflammation and damage to the brain following infection, and that this could be what was causing the CCP virus to exhibit the symptoms seen in psychiatric circles, that brain fog, seizures, psychosis, many of the symptoms that we're seeing, all down to the way the brain has become inflamed after being infected. Still in the realm of neurology, but moving away from the CCP virus and instead to migraines. It's about a clinical trial that could see cannabis being used to treat migraines. The trial intends to take up to 90 volunteers, although currently there are only 20 enrolled, and see whether or not cannabis has effect on the duration and severity of their migraines. The trials intended to look at four different formulations. All of these are taken through vaping. The first is a sham group. They will receive a vape which claims to have cannabis content but doesn't. A second will have cannabis flower content which is going to contain THC. The third group a CBD product and the fourth group a combination of both THC and CBD. This will help in figuring out not just what's effective, but more importantly, if cannabis is effective as a treatment, at least in a small scale initial trial. Based on the results of this, they can then start looking at where to explore further and scale up accordingly. Next is a similar vein of thinking. It's still in the realms of neurology, but veering drastically away from clinical practice. Instead, this is the new dress picture. Is this a blue or yellow dress? And the new study is, are these balls colored or are they all beige? In fact, they're all beige. The different colors you see here, whether that is blue, red, green, or beige, is all a product of your mind. This specific example uses something known as the Munker White Illusion. It works by trying to get your brain to figure out colors and then apply them without those colors actually being there. This means that by using certain shapes, your brain will fill in colors and the colors will provide detail that's not necessarily there. 
The idea here is to study not just 3D shapes, but 2D shapes, and to see whether or not the effect is more pronounced, and at least with 2D shapes that appears to be the case, and then understand what's happening. It's not entirely clear why, and even the researchers themselves don't think anybody else has a clear understanding either. Going now from the bizarre way the human brain works to psychedelic drugs and insects. Indiana is currently experiencing one of its regular cicada rhythms, specifically the brood X rhythm. This is when they suddenly come out of hibernation where they've been sitting for about 17 years and breed prolifically. Then they go away for another 17 years. In this case though, psychedelic drugs could be playing a role in causing their rear end to fall off. That of course is not the whole story. There's a fungus that will infect them when they're in the ground, and it's related to the magic mushroom family. It invades their body and begins to eat away at the insides. Eventually their abdomen will fall off, and this will get replaced with a mass of white spores from the fungus. This process won't kill the cicada, and so the cicada will go on and continue trying to mate and reproduce. This of course won't really work, but what they do do is spread the spores to not only other places, but other cicadas. One way it's spread is that when trying to reproduce, their abdomen, which has been replaced by fungus, comes into contact with their new partner. This now effectively acts as an STD, and is spread to their partner. Interestingly, the fungus also causes a change in behaviour. Nominally, the male would have a humming sound, and the female would bat its wings. Due to the mind-controlling effect of the fungus, the male will both flick their wings and hum. This causes them to attract both males and females. This leads them to having a far larger body of possible mates, and as a consequence, a far larger body of possible victims to infect with the spores of the fungus. If that doesn't sound horrifying enough for you, let's move on to the scientists who are trying to fire tardigrades out of a gun to see just how, and to a certain degree if, they would survive impacts in space. Tardigrades are known by various names. This includes cute nicknames such as water bears. They're also well known for being incredibly resilient and one of the toughest, most resilient organisms on Earth. When in a dry environment, they can desiccate their own bodies and enter a sort of suspended animation. They can then undesiccate themselves when circumstances allow. They can also survive freezing temperatures, zero oxygen, high pressure, radiation, and the vacuum of space. There are even examples of them surviving boiling water. You would think something that could do all of this is practically immortal and indestructive. This is where an astrochemist and astrophysicist from the University of Kent in the United Kingdom come in. They have a special device called a two-stage light gas gun. This uses gunpowder to initially accelerate a projectile, and then gas, such as hydrogen, to put it under pressurization and achieve incredibly high velocities. These are speeds verging on 30,000 kilometers an hour. You can imagine that at that speed, that could cause a lot of damage to something large. But what about the tardigrades? Well, this is something that's been going around in astronomical circles, given the recent loss of tardigrades on the moon. Given the size of the device, they don't measure their power in kilometers per an hour. Rather, it's kilometers per second, and it's roughly 8 kilometers per second with their device. In order to get a good idea as to how the tardigrades would survive, they began by freezing them and then putting them into a specially designed carrier. They then fired the tardigrades out of this at a speed of 825 meters per second, or about 0.8 kilometers per second. These could survive after about 8 to 9 hours. 
the tardigrades fired at 901 meters per second, or 0.1 kilometers per second, did not survive. These water bears, despite their vaunted neural mortality, wound up nothing more than bits of tardigrade. In far less morbid news, University in America has taken in over 1,100 baby turtles rescued from storm drains. Stockton University can be found in New Jersey in America. It now has over 1,113 diamondback terrapin hatchling turtles. They are found in storm drains after being washed in there after the turtles come back inland from the ocean in order to lay their eggs. These turtles will be kept for about a year until they grow large enough to be released back into the wild. Hopefully after about a year of growing and being fed, they'll not only be large enough to survive and avoid any predatory birds, but also be able to continue the species. At present, the animals that are grown in captivity are in some instances more than the number of wildly growing instances of the turtle. This means it's a great way to conserve the species. In an instance of a species that you may think should not be conserved is this rather bizarre and disconcerting looking deep sea fish. It washed up on a California beach this week. It's known as an angler fish and you may recognize the name from several movies for children in recent years. The intact body washed up on a shore in Crystal Cove State Park in Orange County, this being part of California, and was found by a beachgoer. Consider that the fish was found on a beach and it's normally living somewhere near 1,000 meters below sea level. It's come a very long way under very unusual circumstances. Going now from animal environment related news, we'll talk about the environment in general now, and particularly a very large iceberg that has broken off from Antarctica and is now floating away. This is a just over 4,300 square kilometer iceberg that's broken off from Antarctica's ice shelf. It's rather unimaginatively named A76. This massive ice is currently not in the top 10 icebergs to break away from Antarctica, according to New Scientist. It is, however, a very large mass of ice. Fortunately, it's unlikely to have any particular effects on the local environment as this is an area well known for regularly having icebergs break off. This is a process known as iceberg carving. That is carving as in a cow calf, not carving as in ice carving, funnily enough. Assuming the iceberg stays in that area, it's unlikely to make any effect on anyone or anything. However, if it moves into other areas, it could have impact on access to various things. This could include penguin colonies, parts of the Antarctic coast, and more. Finally this week, we have news about the successful landing of China's Zhurong Mars rover. This is China's attempt to get a probe on the Red Planet, and it is their first. As with NASA's various rovers over the years, they begun beaming signals back to Earth. And the pictures taken of it have proven not only has it landed safely, but that it can begin working. Zhurong is expected to have a lifespan of about three months possibly longer if past NASA rovers are anything to go by, although there's also a chance it could be significantly less if there are any mishaps. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions that you have in the comments section below.